I never realized it growing up, but the schools I attended were poor. I had a grounded view of television because my father drilled into me that most things on television are fake. When I saw these elaborate vacation episodes on television, or an entire cast of schoolmates go to Disneyland or some other sponsored locale, I knew that didn't happen in real life. In real life, field trips were to the local library. Sometimes you piled into a school bus and visited the geology department at the University of Nevada, Reno, but it was only if the class was really good that month. Once in 8th grade, I went on a special field trip for a select few kids from each middle school in the area, and we visited a ski resort for the day. The idea was to learn how a ski resort operates. At the end of the day, we left the ski resort. I won't say which ski resort it was, but it recently changed its name because it had a racial slur in it. It was called the racial slur when I visited, so I had a bumper sticker with the original name proudly displayed in my locker. The early aughts were wild. All this to say that I never thought any school had overnight trips. That was a plot device in the TGIF lineup. A few years ago, a friend of mine told me her son was going to a field trip to Disneyland where they were going to see how the theme park operates. I said something about having to drive that much in one day to get the kids back. She said they were staying in a hotel. I realized I had been lied to. Overnight field trips do exist, just not for the schools I attended. The BSC is going on an overnight field trip to a ski lodge. That does not contain a racial slur in it. I was jealous. How come these kids get to hang out overnight in a beautiful lodge just because they were born in a more affluent zip code? Then I remembered who I was in the 7th grade and how my classmates acted toward me and everyone around them. It seems I lucked out. This is rereading my childhood. The Babysitter's Club Super Special number 3, Babysitter's Winter Vacation. So far, the Super Specials have shared two things. Each chapter has a BSC member focuses on, and they all have a central conceit to facilitate the compiling of the stories. In The Babysitter's On Board, Christy is collecting stories for a scrapbook. In The Babysitter's Summer Vacation, Stacy wants to take some memories back with her to New York. This one is no different. This time, Marianne's boyfriend is not on the school trip. Instead, he is in Aruba with his family. Marianne wants to collect stories so he knows what happened on the trip. It's a lot of work for such a disappointing boyfriend. Anyway, this is an annual field trip for Stony Brook Middle School and is mandatory unless you have a good excuse like your family wants to go to Aruba. For me, mandatory attendance usually meant that the school couldn't get kids to show up otherwise. You'd think kids would want to get away from their parents and have a fun trip to a ski lodge, so I wonder what happened in the past. Maybe Stony Brook Middle School uses the trip as a way to price gouge the rich parents and exploit the poor parents. Or Stony Brook's Defordian visage is breaking away and the CD underground is showing again. With money laundering. While the school counts its money, the annual trip to Leicester Lodge in Hookset Crossing, Vermont, that's a pretty great town name, comes with several activities for the kids. The most important is a contest wherein the kids are divided into two groups, red and blue. The school clearly didn't spend any money on name creation. Also, the kids can't just have a week at a resort to learn how it works or to expose them to winter sports or the history of Vermont. No, we need kids to compete against each other. We need to train them so they get used to arbitrary competition so they'll buy sports merchandise and have a strange attachment to a location, America, and think that other countries are shitholes. Other places. Marianne. Oh no, the trip might be cancelled before it's even begun. There's a big storm coming in. Oh, oh wait, don't worry about it. A paragraph later, the vice principal confirms that the trip is still on. As the students of Stony Brook Middle School pile into several school buses, Christy and Claudia, who are on the blue and red teams respectively, bicker about who is going to win the competition. They received their color assignments two minutes ago, and they're already strangely attached to their color. Christy is the team leader for blue, so I kind of understand why she's so attached. Claudia's attachment, however, is a mystery. Marianne bids farewell to Connecticut and hello to Vermont as the buses pull away. Stacy, Unlike Camp Problematic Name, Lester Lodge is aware of dietary needs, so Stacy is already at ease. Without any special extra credit jobs, Stacy is looking forward to a fun week as she sets up some of the major conflicts in this book. Don, Mal, and I were the only club members without extra credit roles in the Winter Carnival. Mary Ann was going to be the historian, Christy was going to run the war, Claude was going to judge the snow sculptures, and Jesse was in charge of talent night. That meant organizing a whole talent show, helping the kids with their acts, arranging for rehearsals, and more. This year was the first time the role had been given to a sixth grader, but we all knew Jesse could handle it. With that out of the way, Stacy can focus on the ride. The boys are annoying everyone by singing John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, which is almost quaint. When I was in the seventh grade, the boys would annoy us by telling us they could smell our vaginas and then ask if our boobs hit our faces when we ran. I would have preferred the singing, honestly. Then the driver almost hits a deer and everyone screams. Done. They arrive at the lodge and find a whole fleet of buses outside. Stony Brook Middle isn't the only school at the lodge. Three other groups of kids will be here this week, she told us. 
one of the eighth graders from a junior high in northern Vermont, another is the seventh and eighth graders from a middle school in New Hampshire, and we're still expecting a group of elementary school children from Maine. The students' bunk arrangements are separated by grade, leaving Mallory and Jesse by themselves. Now they'll have to cultivate their own personalities outside of the other five members of the BSC. Just kidding again. They figure out a way to stay with the rest of the BSC. We'll get to that. There's a bunch of bunk bed talk. Who is sleeping with whom? Who is on the top? Who is on the bottom? Christy has to bunk with Ashley Wythe, a girl who keeps popping up even though I thought we were done with her onerous behavior. But soon, none of it will matter. Again, we'll get to that. Just as the students gather in the huge common room, two adults stumble in the lodge, and they're dead! Not really, but one does have a fractured arm and the other's leg is broken. Christy, the two adults are teachers from Conway Cove Elementary School, and they were in an accident. They braved the storm to reach the cabin and get help for the students who were left behind on the bus. While they wait for an ambulance, the school administrators and the hotel proprietors, the Georges, spring into mild action. There are children who need help. Of course, Christy volunteers the expert services of the BSC. The teachers thank Christy for her willingness to help, but it's an emergency situation. The adults should take the burden to allow the students to relax in a scary situation. Yeah, no, they accept Christy's help, and soon the Georges, a few teachers, and the BSC are piling into an old school bus to rescue some kids. Surprisingly, all 16 kids are waiting in the school bus. One of the kids insists the driver's dead. The driver is not dead. Each of the BSC members watch over a few kids as they all drive back to the lodge. Claudia. The kids arrive at the lodge and they all perk up. Since the nearest hospital is 30 miles away, the lodge doctor will examine each child and any who are seriously injured will be sent to the hospital with teachers who have broken appendages. After dinner, the fates of the children who are not seriously injured are in limbo. Mrs. George expresses that she doesn't want to deprive the children of their ski trip. The school held a readathon to raise money for the trip, and those kids were the winners. How a readathon raises money, I have no idea. But it is completely unfair for the kids if they have to go home just because their bus driver was on bath salts while driving. There is no indication that the bus driver was on bath salts, but there's no explanation for the accident, so I'm going to assume bath salts. Once again, Christy volunteers the BSC to watch over the kids. The teachers don't want to take any responsibility, so they accept. The BSC moves into a dorm with the kids, rendering the scenes where Jesse and Mallory were separated from the rest of the BSC, as well as the bunk arrangement talk, utterly meaningless. Marianne. It's the first morning since arriving at the lodge. The BSC members help the kids get dressed, and then they clamor for breakfast. The Stony Brook PE teacher, Mrs. Halliday, makes some announcements that don't really affect the plot, but she does stuff later, so I have to introduce her. Despite the club's general togetherness, after breakfast, it's a different story. By 10 o'clock in the morning, I found myself pretty much on my own. Christy, Claude, Don, and Stacy had hit the slopes. Mallory was off doing something with her secret journal project, and Jessie had volunteered to entertain Pinky for the day since Pinky was under doctor's orders to stay inside with her foot up. Marianne visits the lodge's library. Her assignment? Research the history of the lodge. If the school has been doing this tradition for years, you'd think a previous student would have already done this assignment, but here's Marianne, reading about the ghost of Lester Lodge. The cook saw a hat fly once. So she writes a letter to Logan even though he's in Aruba. I love the post office, but they cannot get a letter from Vermont, which, if you remember, is covered in a storm, to Aruba, a country in the Caribbean, all in one week. She starts it with, My dearest Logan, and continues with, My thoughts are with you, and only you, every second of every day. Someone took a documentary about the Bronte sisters a little too seriously. Then she worries that he's hanging out on a beach with a pretty girl. She doesn't do any more work on her extra credit project. Jessie. Jessie doesn't want to ski, slip on some ice, and then break her arms and legs, rendering her unable to dance. This seems to bother her, but I think it's a completely fair worry. Instead, she volunteers to entertain Pinky, a girl with a ridiculous name who sprained her ankle on the bus accident. Pinky is a jerk. She's terse and treats Jessie like a personal servant, the optics of which are not great. When Jessie wins a game of memory against Pinky, the girl accuses Jessie of cheating. That seems to be a common tactic for terrible people when they lose. The winner is cheating or committing fraud or switching votes, even though to do so would require the magic of Doctor Strange. Stacy. Stacy assists Mrs. Halliday with the elementary school kids on the ski slopes. After a few lessons, Stacy is free to ski on her own and she goes down the bunny hills. Alan Gray, a boy who harassed the girls, but it's portrayed as comedy, is slamming into the other boys. Eventually, even Stacy is a victim of someone slamming into her. This time, however, it's a cute boy named Frenchie de Croissant. Or, excuse me, his name is Pierre d'Ambois. Of course, Stacy is instantly smitten, and she refers to this as her, quote, first meaningful crush, and, quote, 
any past crushes suddenly don't count. Yeah, fuck clear off, Toby. Mallory. And what is the oldest of the Pike children doing with a journal this time? Is she spying on people again, like in Super Special Number 1? Of course she is. But that's not all she's doing. She's also dealing with a fear of going to a dance. I'm not sure if the dance is mandatory, but it really shouldn't be. When I was in middle school, no dances were mandatory. They also took place during school hours, and if you didn't go to the dance, you had to go to the library or the cafeteria. The school held the dance just after lunch, and afterwards, you still had to go to 7th period. Cool dance! Anyway, Mallory has another reason for her journal-based project besides spying on her friends and teachers. I plan to work hard on my writing since I want to become an author one day. See? If a publishing house sacrifices privacy at the altar of capitalism, then it's completely acceptable behavior. The Supreme Court says that we don't have privacy for the sake of capitalism and keeping a supply of babies for entitled couples, so the students of Stony Brook Middle School have no reasonable right to expect privacy. Too soon? Should I leak this and then jack off for two months and release it anyway? Mallory discovers Marianne missing Logan, Miss Halliday crying, the other kids not liking Pinky, and Stacy making out with some boy. She says that the contents are too mature for her siblings. There's a kid's movie where a bee fucks a grown-ass woman, so I wouldn't be worried about the triplets reading about consensual kissing between teenagers. Dawn. Dawn is having some trouble. She screws up during the ice skating relay. Dawn drops the baton, her team loses, and since everyone has such an attachment to whatever team color they're on, I don't remember who's on which side, the whole team is angry at Dawn and they bully her. They pummel her with snowballs. Because that will help the team win the next competition, I think? I'm not sure what they're going for. Dawn finds Marianne and tries to confide in her, but all Marianne can think about is her dopey boyfriend. Dawn fires her as her bunkmate, but Dawn can't fire Marianne because Marianne quits. Marianne. Marianne speaks with an old lady who has never heard of the Lester Lodge ghost. Then she talks to the cook who saw the flying pan. Then she talks to another old person who doesn't know anything about the ghost. Finally, she talks to Mr. George. In the late 1930s, a visitor was found dead in his bathtub, and after that, some guests reported some strange occurrences. And that's the end of the ghost talk, because it's time for Marianne to mope about Logan again, this time with her teacher, Miss Halliday, who is missing her fiancé. Christy. Christy and Claudia set up an impromptu snowman contest for the elementary school kids. But what could we give the Conway Cove winner? I know, Claudia cried suddenly, but I can't tell you what it is. It'll be a surprise. What if we don't like it? asked Amber. Yeah, I thought. But all Claude would say is, trust me, it's good. She has no idea what to give the winner. A surprise is code for give me some time to scrap something together. Claudia snaps a Polaroid of each kid with their snowman creation. The prize is a ribbon under their Polaroid. The kids seem happy. I would have opted for the cash instead, but that's just me. Later, it's finally time for the official snowman building contest between the red and blue teams. Because it would be a conflict of interest, Claudia sits out. No, I'm just kidding. Like a Supreme Court justice, Claudia disregards her obvious conflict of interest and judges the contest in her own team's favor. Christy is upset. Is it because of the obvious issue of having a member of one team judge both teams in a subjective contest? No, it's because Claudia is a good skier. Claudia. Despite Claudia's skiing prowess, she still takes some lessons from a professional. The professional turns out to be a cute guy named Guy. For the third super special in a row, Claudia has a crush. Remind me, who is supposed to be the boy crazy one? After a skiing montage, Guy, who looks about 25, calls her a champion in an exaggerated accent. Claudia knows that Guy loves her, which would be a felony. Jessie. Jessie goes over the logistics for the talent show. The teachers want to cannibalize the time, so there's only about 38 minutes for the students in this student talent show. Anyway, it's time for tryouts. Some girl sings a song called Stop Pickin' on the President. I have never heard of this song, but it sounds terrible. Regardless of who the president is, everyone should pick on the president. And it's Biden right now, if there's any doubt, which there shouldn't be. We should always pick on politicians in power. And the dead ones, too. Alan Gray does some vaudeville sketch. Some girls lip sync to some Apple song. Another girl tap dances. Another set of girls puts on a skit about a ghost that was both, quote, funny and scary. Finally, one kid does doe a deer with his armpit. Stop the con- stop the contest! Stop! Just send that kid up there for 38 minutes. 
even the elementary school kids audition, most of them sing old 50s songs. It's weird. The only old 50s song I remember at a school talent show was when my friend danced to the song Polka Dot Bikini in an outfit appropriate for the song title, but not for a first grader. Most of the songs at the school talent shows that I attended in elementary school were contemporary. The first talent show after the Macarena featured 50 kids doing the dance on stage at the same time. However, the abundance of 50s nostalgia is not the least realistic thing about the talent show. Stay tuned for that. The rest of the elementary school kids who aren't talented enough to sing 50 songs need to do something, so Jesse suggests they put on a skit about their school and teachers. Pinky says that it might be a bad idea because the teachers might get mad. Jesse suspects that Pinky voted for Trump. Excuse me. Jesse suspects that Pinky is a racist. Don. Don's feelings of inadequacy are taking over, so Don declines to participate in the snowball fight, which is actually just capture the flag. Instead, she goes to the library and plays Monopoly with two randos who don't matter. What matters is that Don loses so quickly that the randos are astonished. So I guess that means the game only took seven hours instead of the usual seven days in a phone call. Then Don sees Pinky crying. Pinky says she's been unpleasant because she's homesick. That's supposed to excuse her behavior toward Jesse. I don't buy it. She was unpleasant to everyone, but the only person she treated like a servant was Jesse. I don't care what Don says. I still think Pinky is racist. Don rewards Pinky's behavior with hot chocolate. Marianne. And just like that, Don and Marianne make up. Then Marianne is back to writing letters to Logan that sound like she's a Victorian ghost whose husband hasn't come back from his whaling trip. My dearest, darling Logan, how I miss you, how I pine for you, how I yearn and long for you. After that, she writes a terrible sketch that implies she's not a feminist, which would be massively disappointing. When she gives the sketch to Jesse, Jesse tells her that they already have a sketch, but thanks for trying. Then Marianne gets a call. It's from Saturday Night Live. They want to do her terrible sketch instead. Not really, it's just Logan. They say they miss each other and have a boring conversation and say they love each other. Womp womp. Mallory. During her spying, the youngest BSC member mistakes Parmesan cheese for poison. Then she blames Pinky's racism on Jesse. Sort of. She decided that Pinky's nasty behavior was the result of being prejudiced, but if Jessie had opened her eyes and looked beyond her own problem, she'd have seen that Pinky was having some trouble being away from home. Oh, how silly of Jessie, a person who experiences racism every day, think that a girl who treats Jessie like a servant may be prejudiced. Yes, the problem is on Jessie, not the girl who acts racist when she's sad. First Marianne is making fun of feminism, and now Mallory is making excuses for the racist kid. This is not a great look. <laughs> Later that night, the students gather in the main room and tell ghost stories. They are mostly of the urban legend variety, including the woman whose dog bit off a would-be burglar's finger, which I think was on an episode of Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction, and the escaped maniac slash boyfriend scratching at the roof of a car. The stories spook the kids. When I was 13, I knew all of those urban legends better than I knew the stories in the Babysitter's Club. It probably helped that there was a movie about all those stories called Urban Legend that we all watched and loved. Looking back, I can't recommend the movie. The best thing about it is that Jared Leto, who portrayed the main lead, doesn't think he's in the movie. <laughs> like, there's video proof, dude. The video proof is you in the movie. <laughs> like, come on, bro. <laughs> Jesse. It's finally talent night. The teachers need their 15 minutes of fame because they didn't get it when they were young and hot. We have come to the least realistic thing about this story, grinding the book to a halt, reminding us that an adult woman wrote these. One teacher stepped forward and said, Welcome to the doo-wop stop. Then he stepped back in line. For the next seven or so minutes, those teachers sang a medley of 50s hits. That in itself was pretty good because it turned out that these, like, math and social studies teachers could really harmonize. But the fun part was that they changed the words of the songs, so they were singing about things like kids cutting classes, the noise in the cafeteria, the bus ride to Lester Lodge, and even the Winter War. When they were done, they somehow seemed like real people to me instead of just teachers. I guess they sounded like that to the rest of the kids too because they got a huge round of applause. What? Absolutely not. I went to talent shows. I went to mandatory pep rallies. I went to school presentations. At all these events, teachers sometimes did things like lip sync, put on little sketches, sing songs, or dress up in what they thought was hip, quote-unquote, clothing. 
I watched all these attempts to connect with the kids. I saw it all and I never thought it was fun, interesting, relatable, or whatever it was supposed to instill in me. What it did instill in me was embarrassment for me, for the teachers, and for everyone involved. I wanted to curl into the tiniest iota of a ball and fly away to a place where I didn't have to watch whatever the teachers were doing. Sometimes we didn't know the old song they were singing and then they tried to get us to sing along. Yeah, you can't sing along to a song you don't know, Mrs. Parker. Not knowing the old song was better than when they tried to be contemporary. That was worse. That was a nightmare. It was not fun when they changed the lyrics. Hey, that's not the song I know. Just sing the stupid song like it sounds on the radio. But that wasn't what made it a nightmare. Sometimes the teachers would dress up. They'd put on puffy pants, backwards hat, and those sunglasses that were slit. And then they'd rap. And they'd rap and dance. They gesticulate in a way that for them meant hip hop, but for us, it meant they never listened to anything harder than vanilla ice. Only clean rap for them. Looking back, their performance was probably quite racist, like Baby's first minstrel show. And after it was over, there was no wild applause, there was no admiration. There was polite, if not lackluster applause and relief that it was over. And then there was reflection. How do they not know that's not how you dress or dance? Do they know the actual song? Do they know how California love actually goes? Finally, the dread set in. Are we going to be like that? Jessie may have had a good experience, but she was written by an adult white woman who forgot about the abject embarrassment intrinsic to teacher performances. The rest of the talent show features 50s music and a boy redoes a skit from I Love Lucy. Finally, Pinky apologizes to Jessie. Now the doo-wop show should apologize for digging up memories I thought I had banished into the farthest depths of my mind. Claudia. While fantasizing about her ski instructor as if he were a predator, somehow Christy's team, Blue, defeats Claudia's team, Red, in the ski race. At lunch, Claudia talks about how Guy likes her. Marianne says he's too old, and she would be correct. Claudia remarks that age doesn't matter. Claudia, age matters a lot. The only dudes who would agree with you are dudes you shouldn't be talking to. They're also the ones who know the age of consent in every state. Then Guy introduces Claudia to his family, a wife and kid and everything. Guy is not a predator, but Claudia is still devastated. I, the reader, am relieved. Christy. The first thing Christy does that morning is scour the cafeteria for cross-country skiers. She finds two victims, both of whom have little to no experience with cross-country skiing. One ends up falling and the other kid breaks his ankle. Christy's team loses both the event and the entire war. Christy finally realizes she's been a jerk and runs to Marianne. She says that the point of the game was to have fun. No, Christy, the point of the game is to get you accustomed to pointless competition, so the only way you can feel successful is through the suffering and loss of another person or group of people. Marianne soothes her. Mallory. Mallory doesn't want to go to the dance because she can't dance. I think it's a valid reason, but the other members of the BSC don't think so. Plus, the elementary school kids are going to the dance also, so it's more like a school-wide gathering with dimmed lighting. Anyway, because people can't just say no and everyone stops bothering them, Mallory goes to the dance. Some boy from her math class asks her to dance. Mallory wonders what she was worried about. I continue to think dances are stupid. Stacy. Stacy puts in a fancy hair clip and dances with Pierre. They promise to write each other. He kisses her hand and she vows to never wash her hand again. Stacy becomes a super spreader. Marianne. They arrive back in Stony Brook safely. There are some postcards and Marianne refers to the BSC as the greatest friends in the world. Once again, it's time for my arbitrary ranking of the stories, starting from the worst and ending with the best. Christy, who the hell cares about the Winter War? Dawn, see Christy. Claudia, I'm glad Guy wasn't a predator, but she needs a different storyline besides a crush. Stacy, Pierre seems fine. There wasn't much Winter War with her stuff, so that was welcome. Mallory, why is she spying on people again? Also, if she doesn't want to go to a dance, don't make her. Why are the characters so dedicated to making people do things they don't want to do? Jessie, I don't care what her reasons are. Pinky is a miserable character to read about. 
I wholeheartedly disagree with Jesse about teachers performing, but I enjoyed the talent show auditions. It would be nice for Jesse to participate in something besides a talent show, though. She needs her own little romance instead of Claudia for the millionth time. Marianne. The archaic prose in her letters made for the funniest moments in the book, but not for the right reasons. I liked the ghost stuff, but Marianne's pining overshadowed what should have been a spooky tale about flying cutlery. Overall, this book is a rehash of previous super specials. Claudia gets a crush, Mallory is spying, Jesse is dealing with a talent show, and Christy is being a jerk. The only characters who get some variety are Stacy and Dawn. It's not like they should stop doing those things altogether. I just want an iota of variety. Add a little spice. Additionally, the stories didn't connect as much as I would like. Sure, characters had cameos in other characters' stories, but none of these cameos really affected or changed a potential outcome for another character. Dawn sort of caused her team to lose the war, but when Christy was scrounging for cross-country participants, I think the fate of the blue team was sealed. But you know what? There are so many more super specials in the future and more opportunities to see the BSC in unusual circumstances. It wasn't perfect, but I did have an enjoyable time reading it, even if it brought up some memories I would have preferred to keep buried. So, if you're in a beautiful cabin like the BSC members, at a beach in Aruba, or at home reading a book, I hope you're safe and warm. Happy holidays, and I'll see you next time.